Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Hepatitis C and Pregnancy. For your information, all participants' microphones are muted. If you have any questions that you would like to be addressed along the way or after the presentation, please use the Q&A box or the chat if that's specified. Um, the Q&A box is located in your Zoom taskbar at the bottom of your Zoom window. The chat box is also available if you have any comments or technical questions. My name is Savannah Holt, and I'm the Sexual and Reproductive Health Program Coordinator with the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. The Prevention Institute is a provincial nonprofit organization that's located in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Our organizational focus is to reduce disabling conditions in children using primary prevention methods. We raise awareness by providing training, information, and resources based on current best evidence. We believe that all children, regardless of ability, have the right to the best physical, social, and emotional health possible. We work in a variety of areas, including fetal alcohol spectrum disorder prevention, maternal and infant health, early childhood mental health, child injury prevention, child traffic safety, parenting, and sexual and reproductive health. One focus of the Sexual and Reproductive Health Program is to provide evidence-based information on sexual and reproductive health that is accessible to healthcare practitioners and allied health professionals. Rates of hepatitis C virus in Saskatchewan are among the highest rates in the country, and rates are particularly high among people of childbearing age. It is important that care providers have information related to testing and treatment in order to reduce negative outcomes whenever possible. It is now my pleasure to welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Kaylee Gartner. Dr. Gartner is a family physician working at the Saskatoon Community Clinic and Westside Clinic in an interdisciplinary team-based care setting. Her practice includes caring for people during pregnancy, in labor and birth, and caring for families postpartum and beyond. She completed enhanced clinical skills at the University of British Columbia Department of Family Medicine and addictions and, in addictions medicine and HIV care at the St. Paul's Immunodeficiency Clinic, Vancouver, BC. She previously practiced in Vancouver at Shiwei, a pregnancy outreach program for women with substance use pregnancy, substance use in pregnancy in the downtown east side, as well as Maxine Wright Health Center in Surrey, BC, along with providing family practice maternity care at BC Women's Hospital and Surrey Memorial Hospital. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Gartner. Good afternoon, everybody out there. Um, so yes, we're going to get started. We're talking about hepatitis C implications for women's health, pregnancy, and newborn care. Okay, so objectives for today. So we're going to review the epidemiology of hepatitis C in Saskatchewan and Canada. We're going to discuss approaches for prevention, screening, diagnosis, and treatment of hepatitis C for people who are pregnant and may become pregnant. And um, hopefully you'll come away with some of your key messages for that and review considerations for prevention, screening, and diagnosis um, of hepatitis C for newborns. So I need to acknowledge um, that um, I was I'm originally from Saskatchewan, so I was born in a small town called Etonia in the southwest part of the province on Treaty 6 territory, and now I'm here in Saskatoon. Um, I need to acknowledge all of the um, ancestors and traditional caretakers of this place, um, and including Cree, Dene, Anishinaabe, Dakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, and I think this is just important um, for us to reflect on and for me personally, um, as I am a descendant of settlers who, and I've had many benefits of being able to live in this land and um, you know, being an uninvited guest here really. So um, we're gonna talk a bit about, um, you know, kind of why that's important as things go, as, as the presentation goes along. Um, so we know that high rates of chronic conditions do not occur in isolation, rather health inequities are shaped by and rooted in the inseparable relationship between health and generations of racist colonial policies. The effects of colonization have resulted in a legacy of environmental dispossession, degradation of the land, substandard living conditions, inadequate access to health services, social exclusion, and a dislocation from community language um, and culture. 
These policies have clearly been linked to adverse health consequences for individuals and communities. Um, this is from the First Nations Information Governance Center National Report. Um, and I need to acknowledge all of the um, teachers, scholars, um, authors who I've learned a great deal about um, my own place here and continue to learn every day. And I think this is just important to acknowledge um, when we're talking about hepatitis C, we're talking about so much more. Um, and I would be interested if anybody is out there in the chat, if you have any other resources or reading to share um, related to kind of our bigger context, I'd be really happy to learn from you as well. I also need to acknowledge Amanda Galambos at the Saskatchewan Infectious Disease Network and her email is listed here. She shared some slides with me and um, if you don't already know, Citizen Organization provides a great deal of um, Saskatchewan focused training on HIV and hepatitis C education targeted at primary care. Uh, their courses are free and accredited for CME learning. Um, and so reach out to her. She'd be really happy to help connect you for further learning. And thank you, Lynette, who wrote An Inconvenient Indian by Thomas King is a book I would add to those you've, you've shared. And yes, that is a, um, another one for our reading list as well. Thank you. Okay, and my other, con my conflicts of interest, I guess. So as you heard, I'm an employee of the community clinic. And I work within Saskatchewan Health Authority. That's where I get to catch babies and see moms and families and babies postpartum. And these views are my own, not representative of my employer. And I have no financial conflicts of interest. If anybody, I was just, if anybody's um, willing to or interested to share your name in the chat there, um, your role and location, just so that we can know who is out there in the internet today. Um, for those of you that are listening later on, thank you. And just feel free to write in the chat and interrupt me at any time. Um, so we're talking about hepatitis C. It's a single-stranded um, RNA virus, has a wide range of genomic variability. Why is that important? That's why it's so hard for us to have a hepatitis C vaccine and a uh, you know, sustained immune response and, and kind of the reason why people can be reinfect, reinfected with um, hepatitis C. Well, when there's people responding, thank you so much for sharing where you are at. So wonderful. So we can kind of know who, who is listening in today. Um, and yeah, just to remind us also that the World Health Organization and you know, Canadian Hepatitis C Association, the, the bigger goal here is one day to have elimination of hepatitis C infection uh, globally and in Canada, obviously. So um, there's some, you know, documents and um, blueprints shared of how we might get there. And we're fortunate now to have the tools for, you know, diagnosis and treatment and prevention that hopefully that is something we in the future won't have to learn about this topic because it will be a historical factor. Um, okay, so I wanted to share a little case with you, you know, based on real stories, but this is a fictional case um, on Kate, just to kind of ground us in um, how we apply this information in our practices and when we're working with um, people who are pregnant and families. So Kate uh, is a 25 year old female. She's currently pregnant with a desired pregnancy, her first, her first pregnancy. She's approximately 12 weeks along by her last menstrual period. She had her first visit to CU for prenatal care. Um, she's currently prescribed buprenorphine, naloxone, which is a sublingual tablet for opiate disorder. Um, she has a past history of injecting hydromorphone prior to starting treatment with opiate agonist therapy. So we'll just kind of keep uh, Kate in the back of our mind as we go through. So as we heard from Savannah, um, this is the most recent Canadian epidemiology for hepatitis C uh, from the 2017 National Surveillance. Um, you can see that our rate of hepatitis C for new infections across Canada in 2017 was 31.7 um, new cases per 100,000. 
And unfortunately, you can see in that bright purple highlighting of Saskatchewan there that Saskatchewan is by far um, the highest and almost twice the national rate of new infections at 61.7 um, per 1,000. Um, on the right, you can see this Canadian data broken down by age and also by um, gender or sex, so I guess sex, so male and female. And you can see how the new cases, there's a higher rate of new infections um, in females compa compared to males, especially in the 15 to 19 and 20 to 24 age group. So it seems that, you know, the female cases are diagnosed at younger age. Um, and then you can also see the, you know, majority of cases are newly diagnosed um, you know, under age 40 or so. Uh, so what does that look like in Saskatchewan? Uh, this is a little presented a little different way, but this is our number of new cases over time. This is from the Hepatitis C Prevention and Control Report um, up to 2017 data published in 2019 by Saskatchewan Ministry of Health. And this is the most up-to-date that um, we have available publicly. So you can see that over time, um, there's consistently high numbers of new, new cases of HIV diagnosis. And you can see that sustained over time, Saskatchewan compared to Canada's over the decade has been um, about twice the national average. Um, this is some information from a publication um, by uh, Stu Skinner at all looking at uh, hepatitis C diagnoses um, in Saskatchewan on reserve communities. So not representative of all Indigenous people, just, just those on reserve who are included in this um, data set, I guess. But it's looking at how the Saskatchewan province rate at the bottom there in, in green. And then it's looking at First Nations communities. So it breaks it down by the northern communities in the blue line over time, you can see that's about two times the provincial rate. The central First Nation on reserve communities about three times, and then the southern um, six times the national rate. So we're really seeing how First Nations communities um, are disproportionately um, impacted by new hepatitis C infections. What about hepatitis C in pregnancy? Well, there's no Saskatchewan or Canadian data reported publicly um, that I could find. Um, the rate of hepatitis C in pregnancy has been noted to increase in the US, at least with the opioid ep epidemic. So probably similar to Canada. Um, and they, they quoted the, the pregnancy or new, new hep C in pregnancy went from 139 per 100,000 269 between 2011 and 2014. So hepatitis C prevention. Um, so when we think about prevention, I guess it's important obviously to know the modes of transmission. So globally, um, there's a, the modes of transmission are iatrogenic spread. So blood transfusions, surgeries, medical practices without um, like ster sterilized equipment or proper sterilization. Um, in Canada, um, a greater burden related to past history of um, injection equipment, shared injection equipment, or current injection drug use, um, sharing of crack pipes potentially as well, um, and then unregulated or you know tattoos and body art without sterilized equipment. Um, other modes as well that show up in the literature, um, so anal sex or men have sex with men, um, especially in HIV co-infected men who have sex with men, there's been hepatitis C transmission um, demonstrated there, um, perinatal transmission, and then heterosexual sex or penile vaginal sex is um, thought to be a lot less, um, a lot less risk, but is sometimes still reported. And then there's a lot of cases where there's no documented or known risk of exposure. And that could be related to um, maybe people not feeling comfortable sharing that information when the data is being collected or other, other modes of exposure. 
Um, and then I think thinking about the larger context as well, um, what are the what are the bigger factors contributing to this risk? So um, a really important one uh, in the literature is incarceration. So tied to the lack of access to um, harm reduction programming, sterile equipment, um, you know, sterile tattoo um, equipment that's not available in, in corrections. And then I think also, again, tying into the bigger picture of the criminalization of substance use and the criminalization of poverty, um, and then the overrepresentation of um, people who are Indigenous, especially in Saskatchewan's um, correctional system, and how all these factors play into risk of exposure. You know, our lack, lack of access to harm reduction education and equipment, and then again, the underlying um, inequities in income housing violence for example, are going to increase, um, you know, the contextual risk for exposure. So it's not just about injecting, injecting drugs that's putting at risk for hepatitis C, it's those factors that might lead you to have to share with somebody else, um, be exposed to, to someone else's um, um, blood or body fluids. Um, so this is just the Saskatchewan self-reported risk factors over time. So again, showing in yellow there, um, injection drug use. We can have a bulk of exposure um, and then other factors or no known factors um, still accounting for, for a proportion there as well. Okay, so I can see that there's many other um, people with experience in harm reduction who are logged in here, just from the people who have commented. Um, but as you all um, know, or many of you will know more than me, um, hepatitis C prevention and, and HIV and other infection prevention for people who use drugs, um, there's a lot of interventions and a lot of um, really great um, work being done here. So education, access to sterile supplies, um, community-based programs, I know that, um, you know, outreach programs, safe consumption sites, um, these are all interventions with um, really great evidence. Um, safer smoking, so I put a link here, this is um, AIDS Saskatoon or Prairie Harm Reduction now, I did a video on um, educating on safer smoking and, you know, we can see this as a harm reduction tool. Um, if somebody is smoking rather than injecting, that's going to reduce their risk of HIV and hepatitis C exposure, for example. Um, and a lot of advocacy that they've done over um, publicly funded, um, you know, pipes, like safe access to pipes rather than only syringe programs. And of course, access to a full spectrum of mental health and addictions, evidence-based treatment options, um, and then the bigger picture we need to end stigma and eliminate racism, especially from our health services. All right, safe consumption sites, just another little plug here. Um, safe consumption sites promote life, dignity, respect, and access to services. So rather than people um, using drugs in an unsafe site, like this picture um, on the left side, stolen from the internet, of a back alley in um, downtown Vancouver, um, where people you know, don't have um, maybe people around them that can supervise them. They don't have access to the supplies they might need. They might be rushing because they're scared of getting arrested. Um, they might be more likely to share equipment. We know that there's obviously a human cost um, to all of this with our extremely high rates of overdose and overdose deaths, um, but there's also a real cost, um, you know, financial cost too. And so if we were to redirect some of this invested in programs like a safe consumption site as one example, um, we're gonna to to see a, a relatively large savings. Um, you know, there's the cost of a syringe listed here and some water and alcohol swab around $2 um, plus all your you know, staff and supports, obviously it's not the whole budget, but um, safe consumption sites are not just reducing overdose, which is extremely important and reducing, um, reducing risk of infections, but also 
you know, a means to connect people with supports, housing, advocacy, primary care, um, refer them to treatment if they're ready, um, all these different things that are part of what safe consumption sites do. And if you're so inclined and you're getting bored with my presentation and you haven't done so already, you can click on this link. Um, Prairie Harm Reduction made it really easy for us to um, send a letter to our MLAs to um, ask for them to fund these life-saving programs, not just in Saskatoon, but I think we should argue for anybody that needs them in our province and, um, you know, having them tailored to the needs of the, of the different communities. How is hepatitis C not transmitted, which is just as important to make sure we talk with people about. So it's not transmitted with hugging or kissing or sharing, um, you know, food or hairbrushes. Um, this is just as important probably to, to address in stigma to educate on this. Um, occupational risk is possible, but it's extremely rare. Um, if we follow our universal precautions, you know, hand washing and wearing gloves and et cetera. Um, we really don't have to be too overly concerned about occupational risk. Um, and if, you know, if we also know how hepatitis C is treatable and manageable now, so. All right, maybe I'll just pause there to see if there's any questions coming through in the chat. Anybody at this point have anything? To share, I can't see your your faces if you're heckling or disagreeing with me. So I will continue on, but feel free to just chat in there if you have anything. Um, so the natural history of hepatitis C. Again, I I borrowed this from Amanda and edited it a little bit, but from the time on the left side here, when somebody gets exposed to hepatitis C, um, they may go on to develop hepatitis C infection. Um, which is initially um, acute on average for about seven weeks, kind of the acute phase of the infection. Um, and then some of those people, about 80%, would go on to develop a chronic hepatitis C infection. About 20% of people, um, for different reasons, their immune system is able to recognize the virus and clear the virus spontaneously. So um, those people, um, you know, would not go on to have an ongoing chronic infection. Um, with time, with, chron with chronic hepatitis C infection, over time, usually for years, over a period of years, there's um, some inflammation and scarring that can go on in the liver and kind of seeing some of the fibrosis changes that we might be able to detect, detect on blood work or certain types of imaging. Um, and then if that goes on for usually again years, we might see permanent sort of scarring or cirrhosis. Um, and then people that have cirrhosis or this more permanent scarring, about th that's when we kind of are more seeing the decompensation, the um, kind of manifestations of reduced liver function. So that's called decompensated cirrhosis about a risk of 6% of people with cirrhosis will have decompensation each year. So that over time, that risk is, is um, compounding. Also, if people have cirrhosis, um, they're at risk of a kind of liver cancer called hepatocellular carcinoma. So about 4% risk per year of that. Um, so it's at this phase on the right that people are really needing possibly to be assessed for um, liver transplant, and the mortality risk is, is increasing. So with, um, with hepatitis C treatment, ideally we can identify um, this infection in its early stages before there's been any scarring and permanent damage and offer people treatment and have quite a high um, rate of, of cure or successful treatment. We'll talk more about that later. Um, it's also important to remember that um, with after spontaneous clearance or after treatment, there's a, there's always that risk of potentially being re-exposed or reinfected if somebody if somebody um, is around, is exposed to the hepatitis C virus. So again, we don't develop like a permanent immune um, protection. So education, preventing re-exposure is always important, no matter if it's after treatment 
or somebody spontaneously cleared the, the virus. Okay. Just some colorful brochures from Katie, which is a really great education resource for healthcare providers and our clients as well. Um, okay, so for screening, hepatitis C screening and diagnosis. So our screening test is the hepatitis C antibody test and our confirmatory test is the hepatitis C viral load or polymerase chain reaction PCR. Uh, the results for that one can be anywhere from target not detected, which means there's no virus in the blood, um, or we could get a result anywhere from 15 copies per mil to in the millions of copies per mil. Um, there is a test called hepatitis C antigen, which is also done with, with a positive hepatitis C antibody. Um, we'll kind of talk a little bit about that as time goes on, but these are kind of the two big ones that I really focus it on. Uh, so if we go back to Kate, so remember Kate, we, we did our initial prenatal visit with Kate and we talked about her medical history and pregnancy symptoms and questions that she had for today. Um, so we talked with her about prenatal screening that's offered in Saskatchewan and what tests are included. And she's in agreement to getting, oh, she's in agreement to getting her, um, her blood work done and booking a dating ultrasound. Um, so what blood tests would we be order would we order to screen for hepatitis for for Kate? And if anybody out there wants to add and type something in the chat, definitely feel free. I know you're all probably like moving around and not right by your keyboard, so. I will just jump on, but feel free to, oh yeah, there's, thank you. It's hepatitis C antibody test, correct. So yeah, that's our screening test. Um, so in Saskatchewan, we have sort of like an opt out. We have, we have kind of a universal screening for hepatitis C in pregnancy, um, like on an opt out basis. So I guess what I mean by that is when you order a prenatal, panel, um, it will come with HIV test, hepatitis C antibody test, hepatitis B and syphilis and rubella screening. And so generally in practice, we would, you know, kind of offer that panel to, to everybody who's um, having prenatal care. And I would say almost everybody that I talk to, you know, accepts that panel. And so then they are sort of universally screened. Um, if they felt strongly about not having a test, we, we would talk about that. But I think that's a pretty rare um, occurrence that people don't want the screening. Um, so what that looks like on the blood work is, and this is just the address for the clinic I work, it's not any patient information, but I just want to show you what exactly the results look like. So when you order the panel, you get this like top, the top part of this gray box. So you have an HIV test, hepatitis B surface antigen, hepatitis C virus antibody, you can see there, and it says C supplemental test results below. And then it did, they did a hepatitis C virus antigen. And they're telling me here that this person was previously antigen reactive, consider ordering um, a viral, HCV viral load if not already done. Um, and then I've got the syphilis result under there and the rubella result. So if I just got that first box on my prenatal screen, basically it's telling me that this person's hepatitis C antibody was previously positive. So um, I need some more information to kind of know what that means if it's a current infection or past infection. So I need to order that confirmatory test. So that's the the box below there that says hepatitis C virus RNA not detected. Um, so this result tells us this person either had a spontaneous, um, spontaneously cleared hepatitis C or they were previously treated because we saw the virus was not detected there. What if Kate's results were, um, came back as this? How would you interpret these results.
give you one second if you thank you yes active infection yeah great so we can see um our rna is positive so active hepatitis infection perfect so basically our screening results can either come back antibody negative so someone that's never been exposed hepatitis c um and again like i kind of think less about this antigen test because it's kind of confusing but if our antibody is positive and our hepatitis RNA is not detected, this indicates they've been exposed to hepatitis C, but no longer have the virus in their blood. So they've either cleared it spontaneously or they've been cured by medication. We just have to ask them if they've had treatment before, basically to determine that. And this person would not need treatment for hepatitis C, would not be considered infected with hepatitis C, would not have any risk of hepatitis C to their infant, as long as they didn't get infected as their pregnancy went on, I guess. Um, if the antibody is positive and the HCV RNA is detected, and they, um, they have been exposed, and they have current treatment and or current um, virus in their blood, that's where we would consider an active infection and considering for treatment for the hepatitis C. Okay. Um, so history and physical exam. So again, for thinking about Kate, like what kind of things do we need to ask her about um, specifically related to the hepatitis C? Um, if we assume her test results were like that second case where it was positive. Um, so, you know, we might want to think about asking, you know, does she know when she might have been exposed to hepatitis C? Like how long has she had this infection? What do th does she think it was, you know, months or many years. Um, it's not really critical for us to know exactly the mode of transmission. Like if I didn't know about her history of um, substance use in the past, um, I don't really need, it's not really going to change anything right now. And I, and I think in our, especially when getting to know somebody, we should really focus on building trust and reducing stigma and just thinking that probably she's already feeling a lot of stigma, you know, just based on um, things going on in her, like her history of substance use. Um, so maybe over time we'll get that information, but it doesn't really change anything right now. Um, we want to kind of know if she's had any symptoms of hepatitis or liver failure. Um, has she ever had to be hospitalized for liver problems in the past? So we might kind of look for some of those signs and symptoms of um, liver failure or liver um, or hepatitis. And then usually we're doing our complete exam for kind of prenatal patients at some point. Again, doesn't have to be the first visit, but maybe the second visit. And um, maybe we want to um, think about like cardiac exam, thinking about any murmurs, just in terms of other things like um, infective endocarditis or other risks related to um, injection drug use, if that was the mode of transmission. Um, and skin exam and that sort of thing. Um, okay. And I guess just just one point, like when I'm thinking, when I'm maybe doing like a skin exam or um, if somebody like lets me examine their, their skin and I see that there's, you know, track marks on their like arms or on their neck, um, I think trying to approach that in a really like uh, non-judgmental way and, and kind of just asking like, you know, are you are you needing to like inject in your neck? Like, you know, kind of thinking about harm reduction and, and education. Like, is that because you're having trouble using, you know, in your arms? Like just really basic things like, have you used a tourniquet before? Or like, you know, how like what kinds of things do you do to help find your veins? Um, can I help connect you to, you know, a harm reduction nurse or a program? Um, just those kinds of things. And I find if we, if we kind of, we're not even telling somebody they need to stop doing something, but just asking them questions, um, just builds a lot of trust and rapport. And they see like, we're not judging them. We're not telling them what they're doing is wrong. We just really want to help and try to keep them safe. I think that can go a long way. Um, so Kate, Kate asks about the risk of passing on hepatitis C to her child and how it can be prevented. Um, how would you respond? 
And I'm just gonna kind of, just feel free to type in there, but I'll, I feel like I might be, God, I might be kind of slow. So I'm gonna click through. Um, great, I see harm reduction tools, being careful about reinfection. Perfect. Um, yeah, so the risk of perinatal transmission of Hep J C is in the literature somewhere around two to five percent is how it's quoted. Um, this is from the Saskatchewan Hep C report, so our Saskatchewan data, and you can see we don't really know the denominator here. Like it's not reported how many women had Hep C infection in pregnancy, but the literature it's kind of between two to five percent. Um, we know that a lot of 78% of the females diagnosed with hepatitis C in 2017 were between age 15 to 45. Um, so yeah, we, we don't really have any great tools necessarily to prevent hepatitis C transmission, but from observational studies, um, definitely, like you said, the harm reduction, um, you know, sterile equipment, maybe avoiding like a super infection or like an infection with another subtype of hepatitis C. Um, you know, it's the literature talks about like not uh, reducing alcohol use or trying to eliminate or abstain from alcohol use. Um, and then things like HIV co-infection may increase the risk of perinatal transmission. So again, how can we prevent somebody from developing hepatitis or HIV um, in addition to their hepatitis C in pregnancy. Uh, you can see the Carly Posniak's Prevention Institute presentation on PrEP in pregnancy, just a little plug in for that there, um, would be one tool that you could consider. Uh, so other investigations, um, again, I'll just encourage everybody to reach out to Citizen for some really great education on HIV, or sorry, hepatitis C um, work up in that. But generally we're kind of doing some blood tests like hepatitis C viral load we talked about and the genotype. We just need to do those once sort of in pregnancy to kind of have, have that for, which is kind of important for treatment for the future, but um, just to document, is it active infection or not? Um, liver enzymes are, suggested maybe to do each trimester um, based on the SOGC guidance um, and good to kind of have a baseline for comparison as well. We can use these blood tests to um, assess for fibrosis and cirrhosis. So there's the links to these um, online calculators that you can look at later if you're interested. Um, liver like synthetic function tests, platelet count, bilirubin, albumin, INR can give us a sense of the liver function as well. And then we want to make sure we screen for hepatitis A and hepatitis B um, immunity um, because we can offer these vaccines in pregnancy to help protect from other types of hepatitis. And then our co-infection screening. So if we did the prenatal panel, you'll have the screening there and then just considering how you need to repeat the screening over time. Uh, so maybe repeat it each trimester or depending on um, Kind of that individual person's needs. Kate asks how hepatitis C will impact your prenatal care. Will she have to have a C-section? Uh, all right, I'll see if anybody is having burning responses here. Um, okay, so how does it affect prenatal care? I think we we individualize the prenatal care like we do for anybody else. It doesn't, hepatitis C doesn't specifically change prenatal visits or that kind of thing, but we're just gonna tailor our prenatal visits to that person and their needs. A few additional things, um, like I hinted at, we're gonna offer the hepatitis A and B series, and you can ask for public health to assist you with that as well if you don't have the vaccines in your clinic. Um, and then the other vaccines we offer to pregnant people, otherwise seasonal influenza, Tdap booster, and the COVID-19 vaccine, which we now have available as well for people who are pregnant. Um, so Asa Gwen, I hope, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably pronouncing your name wrong, um, responded that I would think that C-section may be recommended. So yes, that's a very um, important point. 
but if under control, they should be able to give birth naturally. Yeah, so, have, or, so in terms of mode of birth, um, there is, there is no evidence that um, interventions in labor, uh, like a C-section, would reduce, oh, thank you, you um, just showed me how to pronounce your name, thank you so much. Um, so there's no evidence that C-section or other interventions have been, will reduce the risk of perinatal hepatitis C transmission. So um, basically labor and birth is managed based on kind of the obstetrical and other medical um, indications. Um, I guess just a word on hepatitis C treatment. Um, hepatitis C is treatable with very high rates of cure, uh, which we call, is call, also called sustained biological response after 12 weeks or SVR 12. Um, the new direct acting anti antiviral medications for hepatitis C are very well tolerated. Um, so everyone who's diagnosed with hepatitis C should have assessment or be referred for assessment with somebody experienced in treatment and be offered treatment. Um, the new hepatitis C antivirals are contraindic contraindicated in pregnancy and breastfeeding, not because they're known to be teratogenic, but just because there's limited data so far. So maybe in the future we'll have more data and be able to offer um, treatment safely. But right now we're still kind of waiting on the data to, to be sure that that's okay to do. Um, ribavirin, which is an older hepatitis C medication not used very commonly now, is teratogenic and must not be taken during pregnancy. And it also should not be used by either partner at least six months before trying to get pregnant. Thankfully, we don't really have to use ribavirin very often. There has been a really small um, phase one study. There, might have been, there may have been more studies now, but this is the most um, kind of recent one I could find. Um, so it was an open label um, study of eight women with hepatitis C genotype one who were treated with, um, with a combination of the new direct act antivirals, sofosbuvir and lidipasvir, in their third trimester. All eight achieved their cure, SVR12, and for the infants there was no fetal anomalies detected, normal birth weights, and no hepatitis C perinatal transmission. So that's just eight um, infants, um, so we're going to need more data before we would widely um, adopt this to our practice, but I think it's really exciting. Um, so there is some documentation in the literature about hepatitis C potentially increasing the risk for gestational diabetes in the pregnant person, preeclampsia, or cholestasis of pregnancy. Uh, these are pretty, these are conditions that we screen for in pregnancy routinely, so I don't think that it, really has to change much in our practice, but just potentially to be aware. Um, pregnancy may also increase the chance of spontaneous hepatitis C cords. So that's interesting. And um, again, doesn't really change too much, but might be a bonus. So we kind of touched on this a bit. In laboring birth, um, we kind of manage based on other indications. Hepatitis C in itself doesn't change anything. Um, interpartum fetal assessment, we follow the SOG, SOGC guidelines as we would for anybody else. Hepatitis C isn't a reason to need to do any more intensive monitoring of the fetus. Um, so like everybody else, we prefer intermittent auscultation unless there's um, other risk factors. No evidence that C-section reduces hepatitis C perinatal transmission. Um, there is isn't a suggestion to avoid fetal scalp electrodes and episiotomy and, you know, pH scalp, scalp sampling unless, you know, absolutely indicated. Again, these are procedures that we always avoid unless absolutely indicated. So if it's a matter of fetal well-being, um, then, you know, just I think a discussion with the pregnant person, the risks and benefits and documenting that discussion, but um, if needed. 
if indicated, then the, these there's not an absolute contraindication. And again, for the healthcare providers, universal precautions for blood and body fluid exposure, as you would for everybody else. Um, no need for any um, extra interventions. Okay, so back to Kate. Kate desires to breastfeed her infant, but she's concerned she'll pass on the virus. And how would you respond? Um, and then a bonus little question. Can she, not related to this topic, but can she breastfeed while she's prescribed buprenorphine naloxone? Um, does anybody hear their keyboard and want to reply there? So, um, I don't think so. Can she breastfeed? So the question is, so, um, I don't think so. So do you don't think she can breastfeed? Is that, am I reading your um, response correctly? Okay. Not sure. And then uh, Nicole Dubois can breastfeed. Okay, great. So, um, so we would support breast or chest feeding um, um, as we would for all other infants. So that's to say hepatitis C infection is not a contraindication to breastfeeding. So we wanna encourage breastfeeding like we would for all other pregnant people. Of course, it's, um, you know, it's the parent's choice and, and there's um, a lot of other factors that might play in there, but hepatitis C in and of itself is not a contraindication. And Nicole is correct that um, with the buprenorphine naloxone, we also encourage breastfeeding. Um, Yes, and that's correct. With hepatitis C treatment, we we typically want to wait until somebody's not breastfeeding, but hepatitis C infection um, is safe to breastfeed. Um, otherwise, the care in hospital is routine, I would say, to all other infants. Um, and typically we, Oh, I will go back to Kate for one moment. So Kate had a spontaneous vaginal birth of a healthy, beautiful term baby boy. Her and her partner stayed in hospital for four days to monitor infant, mostly related to her buprenorphine naloxone or suboxone um, for neonatal opiate withdrawal. Um, but not have hepatitis C, you, would, you don't have to stay longer than you know 24 hours or whatever the routine is or otherwise other indications. Um, so they established breastfeeding. Um, she was comfortable with the feeding plan. She's just discharged home. And we're so fortunate to have healthy and home nurses in Saskatoon. So they were gonna arrange a visit and a follow up in the clinic in one week. So how could we support Kate and her partner in this period, in the postpartum period? Any ideas? And just recognizing people have different roles. So um, any ideas of how you might support Kate? Um, in her post in this early postpartum period. So I think we kind of already touched on. Um, yeah, so we just want to um, follow, you know, follow up like we like we want to support any new mom. Um, you know, really, I think there sometimes um, Sometimes moms might, might need more like reassurance about breastfeeding, being safe and being really beneficial um, for her baby. Um, she might need reassurance that, um, you know, that's like a lot of people I think are really worried about the hepatitis C transmission and, you know, knowing that information right away. Um, there's not a lot of, you know, usually we know that the antibodies from the mom will pass on to baby and be detectable in the blood for even up to like 15, 16, 17 months of age. So if we do that test, we know we would expect it to be positive and that does not indicate perinatal infection. Um, and we'll talk about other newborn screening, but I think just a lot of reassurance might be needed. Um, we also wanna kind of engage her in like her plan for treatment. Um, so, 
you know, again, like there's not a, there's not like an emergency that like hepatitis C needs to be treated like ASAP. So, you know, we can encourage her to breastfeed as long as she is wanting to, you know, um, whatever that timeline is. And then just have a plan of like, okay, like when you decide to stop breastfeeding, let's make sure that you follow up so that we can um, have a referral for treatment. And then also thinking about her partner, partners, whether that's like sexual partners or um, anybody that she may be exposed to their blood or body fluid, um, how can we help them be engaged in, in getting on treatment if they are hepatitis C positive or getting tested, that kind of thing. Um, there's a note, oops, there was a note about, what did I do here? Um, a question about what do we recommend if the nipples begin to crack and bleed? Um, yeah, and thanks for right, um, bringing that up. I didn't include it in the slides, but yeah, generally if there's cracked and bleeding nipples, that, that is technically suggestion to um, pump and not use that breast milk until the infection or until the nipples heal. Um, again, I'm sure that that's probably a pretty rare risk to the infant, but you know, that, that is the official SOGC statement as well. Um, and so I think, and I think the other thing is if there's cracking and bleeding in the nipples, similar for other women, like we would want to make sure we check, like, how is the latch? Is it, you know, how do we, is there like um, anything we can do to improve, improve the latch so that the, she's not having trauma to the nipples, um, breastfeeding support clinics or like nurses or lactation consultants that could be able to help in that situation um, or other things like, um, you know, like a yeast infection or candida infection, infection, those sorts of things that might be going on. But usually it's probably related to the latch for baby. So yeah, we're going to instruct her to, um, to kind of not breastfeed baby on that side, maybe just to be pumping on that side until it heals. Um, contraception options um, are pretty similar to general population. So we're going to talk through about what her wishes are there. And, you know, generally um, the progesterone only options probably are a little bit better postpartum because they're less likely to interfere with milk supply um, and then our ongoing education. Okay. So for newborn screening, um, like I was mentioning, usually the hepatitis C antibody you expect to be positive for a number of months. So we could do screening at 18 months with the antibody test. Um, you can also do a hepatitis C RNA or viral load test um, earlier. Um, if it was negative on two different occasions between, you know, age two to six months or after age, after two months, then that would be considered um, or sorry, if it was positive on two occasions, that would be considered evidence of perinatal infection or if the antibody test at 18 months was positive. So we just wanna make sure that there's some kind of follow-up plan arranged and maybe we also, depending where you are, you wanna involve pediatric infectious disease physicians. We usually have our um, infants referred just to make sure that they get their screening done in case they change care providers or move. Um, that clinic can make sure they get follow-up. And then we also just want to remember that there's a lot of infants that don't get offered that screening, maybe because mom was aware of her hepatitis C status. Um, so that's maybe an area that we can, in primary care, can kind of improve on um, that follow-up testing. Uh, yeah, and so treatment, again, just a plug for hepatitis C treatment easier and more effective than ever, well-tolerated -toler medications, um, learn more with especially Citizen is a great resource and contact Amanda, her email address is on there. Um, and this is just kind of a neat slide showing the different hepatitis C treatments over time. Again, shared by Amanda from Citizen. Um, so you can see in terms of the y-axis here, this is effectiveness of, or cure rate. And now 2016 and beyond, we're at like 95 to 100% cure rate for our treatments um, back in early days, early treatments, um, you know, under 10% cure. So um, that is really exciting and um, just encourage any prescriber type people to learn more about hepatitis C treatment. Um, and then I just, yeah, I have some resources here at the end and references and a couple minutes <laughs> for any other questions. 
Um, and thank you guys so, thank you all so much for attending and your interest. And I look forward to learning more from all of you as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner. I think you've addressed some of the questions that came in as, as they were coming in, um, mostly related to HCV uh, transmission via breastfeeding. So just to confirm, there's no risk of that transmission unless there's potential cracking or bleeding? Yeah, so my understanding from the literature is that there have been some studies that found hepatitis C in the breast milk, um, but there's been no documented perinatal transmission from breastfeeding. So I think that the cracked and bleeding nipples thing is a little bit of a maybe theoretical risk is my understanding, but the guidelines are, yes, if there is cracked or bleeding nipples to avoid breastfeeding on that side, pump and, um, pump and not use that milk. Um, but otherwise breastfeeding has so many benefits. So we really should um, support women who want to breastfeed and not um, discourage them because of hepatitis C infection. Thank you. Um, the next question, how do we help support their liv liver function in pregnancy? Is it mostly monitoring? Yeah, so I think the fortunate thing is that most, um, most people that we see in pregnancy with hepatitis C will probably be, probably have normal liver function, less likely to have cirrhosis. Um, probably it's earlier in their hepatitis C infection. So mostly it's just monitoring. But if you, if you were seeing somebody that had, like did tell you they had um, history of cirrhosis or hospitalization for liver problems or, you know, history of yellow skin or their blood work came back as abnormal, then those are people that definitely you would want to involve um, like a, a liver specialist, a hepatologist. And again, like if you, I think doing that, doing some more training on hepatitis C, if you, um, through Citizen, is a really great resource to learn you know, who you could manage in primary care and who you might want to refer. Um, and if this is something you don't see a whole lot of, I think just reach out to, um, you know, reach out to like providers in your area, um, be open to like a shared care kind of model. Like maybe you can provide a lot of the primary or prenatal care with a bit of support from, you know, a specialist for, for some things until you're comfortable. But um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question, if mom is positive for HCV, can she pass on HCV antibodies to the baby? Yes. So similar to other antibodies, um, they do cross the placenta. And, you know, that's kind of our reasoning for some of the vaccines we give in pregnancy so that that immune protection from the mom can pass across the placenta and, and by breastfeeding to baby to give them protection. But unfortunately, the hepatitis C antibodies, we know, aren't really helpful for protecting from hepatitis C. So it mostly just um, impacts the kind of screening we do for the, for the newborn. So we can't really use the hepatitis C antibody as a screening test for hepatitis C infection for a newborn if they're you know, under 18 months because we expect it to be positive but not signifying infection. Perfect. Um, what about immunizations for baby of hep C positive mother and when would they receive them? Uh, that's a good question. I think hepatitis B immunization, I believe in Saskatchewan, it's, it's not given in the infant period right now, but I could be wrong. Um, I believe that there's recommendation to, for hepatitis A, at least from the SOGC, to give that like at one year of, one year of age or so. Um, and then hepatitis B immunization in other provinces is given to infants. So, you know, potentially that would be a consideration talking with public health about would there be an indication to give it earlier, but for hepatitis B, but that would probably depend on the client and like other, like if they were hepatitis B positive, then that's a whole other, you know, kind of treatment algorithm for preventing hepatitis B perinatal transmission. Thank you. Um, our next question, when can we start treating the HCV in pregnancy? <laughs> um, well, I think that it's, I think we kind of have to wait until the clinical trials come out so that we can properly, um, you know, counsel people on risk and benefit. Um, you know, eight people having treatment in their pregnancy 
probably for me, I, I wouldn't be going outside of the guidelines right now and treating people in pregnancy. Um, but, you know, I think it's promising. There's probably, I'm, I'm guessing there's probably trials underway. So I think we just have to keep watching for that. And um, once we have the safety data and maybe some longer term data for infants, I think that would be a really great opportunity because, you know, like eight or 12 weeks of hepatitis C treatment might be able to be completed, you know, in pregnancy and then reducing that risk for baby. And then also that mom has now had her treatment. And um, I think it's a, it's would be a nice opportunity. Perfect. I think I have one last question in the time that we have remaining. Um, if a baby is confirmed to be HCV positive, when would they be able to re receive treatment if they don't spontaneously clear that infection? Okay, great question. And I'm not a pediatric infectious disease specialist, but generally my understanding is that, yeah, like some of the infants will spontaneously clear their infection and they're probably, probably more likely to do that than like an adult that gets hepatitis C infection. Um, but they could go on to develop chronic hepatitis C and, and potentially um, have like problems with their liver. So um, I think the other exciting thing in addition to pregnancy is that some of the new direct acting antivirals are being studied at younger ages. So, um, so, so for some, depending on their age and their weight, they might be able to offer them treatment at, um, you know, at a younger age and probably also depends on the clinical picture too. But again, I would just, in that kind of situation, that's out of my scope as a family doctor. So I would be um, referring those infants to a pediatric infectious disease specialist. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gardner. Is there anything you'd like to share before we finish up for today? Well, just thank you all so much for your interest and just feel free to reach out if there's any um, questions or suggestions that you have. Um, yeah, it was great to sort of see you all virtually through the chat, at least. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. A reminder uh, for everyone that this presentation was recorded today, so it will be available for viewing later. And I'll share the link to that recording in a follow-up email along with um, potentially, are you willing to share copies of your slides at all, Dr. Gartner? Yes. I didn't <laughs> confirm. <laughs> yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this great and informative presentation and for sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. Um, as many of you might know, the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute has a lot of free resources available, um, specifically addressing HIV and HCV in pregnancy. Um, we have very recently, last year, created a new web page specific to hepatitis C and pregnancy that includes information on screening, vertical transmission, treatment, pregnancy outcomes, and more. The fact sheet with this information is also available. You can find both through the link that I've dropped into the chat, and I will share that in the follow-up email as well. Um, additionally, I just want to note that if you are looking for resources from us, um, I am currently offering free shipping on sexual health resources in Saskatchewan until um, through the month of June. So you can learn more about our resources by visiting our website, uh, www.skprevention.ca. Uh, once again, a very warm thank you to Dr. Kelly Gardner for joining us today and sharing her time and knowledge. Have a wonderful afternoon and thank you for joining us on this session.